Welcome to the Plant Based Podcast. In case you didn't know already, plants are amazing. You can eat them, wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, grow them, love them, and be inspired by them. So, why not join us on the Plant Based Podcast as we speak to the movers, shakers, and growers in this amazing plant world? This episode of the Plant Based Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Natural Grower. Launched in 2019, their award-winning liquid fertilizer and soil conditioner is made entirely from maize. Visit naturalgrower.co.uk to nurture your soil and boost your plants and veg. Enter PBP15 for a 15% discount as a PBP subscriber. Okay, so for today's podcast, we're actually going to tap into the world of gardening with children. This is not something we've done before, but we think we've got just the man for the job. He's a guy called Skinny Jean Gardner. I came across him first probably about five or six years ago. So we, we've known each other a while. We've done a couple of projects together as well. He's just released a book, which is How to Get Kids Gardening. And we're basically going to talk around that book, some of the projects inside, kind of a few of his own ideas for gardening with kids and obviously with your daughter olive you she's become quite a star of the book so i'm sure she's got some gardening tips for us as well so but first of all take us right back to when you were a child because were you gardening with your parents or did you have any interest in gardening at such a young age no i, did. I never used to do any gardening when i was little oh. and that's, okay. that's like the most annoying thing for me like that's the reason i do kids gardening because because I never used to do it. I never used to do it at school. Like, the only thing I used to do at school was we had a dirty old little pond that, um, that is still there now, actually. And we used to do a bit of pond dipping, and that was it. Like, mm-hmm. nothing at all. So I really feel like I missed out when I was younger. So, um, like, with my daughter and from what I do with kids gardening, I feel like that's what I want to get out there. Like, don't, don't, um, don't miss what I didn't have. That makes sense, does it? But you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we get you, Lee. To be <laughs> honest, I'm most disappointed that the greatest showman in horticulture does not have his gold sequin jacket on for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I feel weird. I don't think I'm going to wear it in 2020. I've not wore it for the whole year, have I? So... I feel like it'll just it'll go down in history as one of those years where I, it was never put on. Okay, all right. So next year you'll dust it down and fling it back over your shoulders. I hope. I actually can't wait. Like, I'm well pumped for it. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to get it back on. That's awesome. what everyone. everyone like, I go to like garden centres and people are like, "Oh, you're not wearing the gold jacket." I was like, "No, I'm shopping around a garden centre. Why would I be wearing it?" <laughs> like, yeah, but it's like. It's a thing, and it's always good to have a thing that people will remember you for. You know, like for Ellen, it's being bossy. People remember her for that, you know. (laughs) Sorry, sorry, sorry. The face I'm pulling right now is one of shock and disgust. (laughs) Do you know what? I was always told that if someone tells you you're a female that you're bossy, it means that you're assertive and that's a good thing. Yeah, no, it's not bad at all. (laughs) (laughs) It just depends on what the subject matter is. (laughs) Well, talking about your gold sequin jacket and, you know, doing the shows that you do, um, tell us about your career. Like, how did it begin? And we know that you've had a switch, but for some of our listeners, tell us about, you know, how and why the switch happened and what you've been doing. Yeah, do you know what? I used to to be an electrician and... When I, when I left school, it wasn't something I wanted to get into. Actually, I wanted to get into graphic design. I was speaking to someone else about this the other day, actually, and, and um, I never got into it. I went travelling, and for the whole year of travelling, I was telling people, yeah, I'm going to go home. I'm going to become a graphic designer. I'm going to design cars. I never did. I think I'd be, like, designing gardens and bit like bits like that. And uh, I came home, and I was just an electrician again. And uh, and then I fell, out, fell in love with gardening, and... That um, that idea of design and stuff 
sort of came through that. And then, as Michael said, I met Michael Perry and my career just took off from there, really. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was a bit of a weird one. Like, it, it, I just got into gardening with my brother mm-hmm. and we enjoyed it. And social media, you know how social media is, it sort of, um, it sucks you in, doesn't it? And um, we met Jimmy Doherty from Jimmy's Farm. Mm-hmm. And started, actually, that's where we met you, Michael, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, around that time when you were doing the Jimmy Slam kind of vegetable plot, yeah, and we started talking about some stuff and hanging out, and yeah, I must I must say, and you, you remind me, I tell you this every time, but in the early days, I couldn't tell the difference between you and your brother. <laughs> I could like never Adam quite Dick. remember who was who. So was okay, like, okay. okay, okay, hang on a minute, I'm going to drop one in here as well then. So when you were at Jimmy's farm and uh, you started to do like the little vegetable garden there, I sent you some uh, grow bags to grow stuff in. And um, it was, you'd done like a little um, video for social media and in the bag was like a little leaflet and it said, you know, who I was and where I sent it from, Ellen Mary, da, da, da. And uh, you or Dale, your brother, said, oh, thanks so much for these bags. Who were they from? Oh, I can't remember who they were from. And then you got, like, the leaflet and then were like, Mary? I think Mary. Yeah, Mary. Mary <laughs> and as you know, being called Mary Ellen really winds me up. <laughs> <laughs> we know back then how much it did wind up. I wish we said it more now. Yeah. <laughs> I did, oh, yeah, I did forget you sent me them bags. <laughs> Hey, I've still got loads of them if you want any. <laughs> anyway. I can't believe someone sent us something. It was amazing. We were like, oh, my God, we've made it. Someone's sending us She's stuff. She's called Mary Ellen. Um, so, yeah, so you started up at Jimmy's Farm, and then what happened next? Sorry, too, sorry, too simple. All right. I missed Scooby-Doo. I didn't get to see who it was. Oh, you're driving him. <laughs> well, oh, okay. Is there another Scooby-Doo? No more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> Better keep this in one. We can count. Don't edit that out. Do you want me to come up? I'm going to do this first. Is she going to come on the podcast? Hey, Olive can come on the podcast Sorry. if she likes. You want to come on the podcast? Yeah. We need her gardening tip. She can sit here with us. Come here then. Where are you? Oh, cool. Well, in can part two, we'll come to Olive for the gardening tips. Yeah. You're going to sit with me? Right, come in then. Ow! You're all right. Ow! You're all right. Do it up or down. What, do you want to test that? What, pop it in your ear then? Right. What's on? Oh, okay. Well, you don't want this on? Okay. Hello, Ellen. Diva. All right. Hi, Olive. Shall we? No. Oh, she's blanking you, Ellen. Nice My life. Okay, well, give me two. Can you just give me two minutes? Sorry. Yeah. Give me two. Right, come here. Come on. Come on. Right. Okay. Cool. We started at Jimmy's farm. I, I, I must say, right. Thank you to Perry because I know I give him a bit of a ribbon now and again. But when I first started, when me and Dale first started at Dale Jimmy's farm. He was actually really helpful. He, I mean, he didn't get his hands messy or anything, but he, he, he was come with the knowledge, which was um, which we didn't have, and the seeds as well. Most importantly, the seeds. Yeah, we um, did a lot of seed hustling, didn't we? Yeah. So, like, you were called our seed, you were our seed dealer. Which, oh, yeah, um, of course, yeah. We, had, we used to stuff. meet in a Costa Coffee, and sometimes you paid me for seeds with brownies. Do you remember? I, they were well, brownies I, I, from was... some Essex bakery or something, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. memories. You two are so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I even had the T-shirt, but, you know, what I loved about you guys was that you you didn't know what like, you were doing, which sounds funny, but that actually made you, one. Of, it gave you one of the best USPs ever because you were learning with your audience so there was no snobbishness, there was no stuffiness. It wasn't like, you know, RHS level horticulture that kind of alienates some people. It was really 
you know, entry level kind of like, yeah, let's just all find out how to do this and, and in very different ways. And that's what made it so fun. And I think that's what helped your following, really. Yeah, we, we, we used to get asked, and I still get asked to do um, RHS courses now, and I'm a bit like, mm-hmm. my, the people that I'm aiming at, like, I think RHS courses are great if that's what you really want to go into, that's mm-hmm. cool, like, get yeah, knowledge, and uh, I'm, I'll never knock that. But for the people that I'm aiming at, and I always use my mate Jason as an example, is mm-hmm. that um, he, he's got a garden, he's got kids, he's not sure what to do with it, and if I start blurting out Latin names, which I think a lot of people know that I'm not a massive fan of Latin names. I know they've got their place, so don't have a go at me. But <laughs> but if I start blurting them out, it totally goes over his head and it, it sort of scares him away, do you know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, I like learning as I go along and um, that's how we learn, isn't it? From failures, a lot of a lot of failures mm. and, um, and the successes too. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. absolutely true. Yeah. I think so much comes from experience, you know, so it's important. And then you um, were then, did you do some work on Blue Peter as well? Yeah, so we did. So we, obviously we were with Jimmy at Jimmy's farm and then we started doing bits with Jamie Oliver, which was wicked. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and then from there, Blue Peter came along. I think between that, I think we did like the whole Sunday brunch, the Alan Titch mm-hmm. march. Um, show which you I saw yourselves in a lot of places. Well, okay. I saw a clip of New Perry the other day on the Alan Titchmarsh show. That's a very young you on there. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. God, so nervous. Horrible clip. Delete it. That, Still was, doing the that, same was, now, that was your first ever TV <laughs> appearance, wasn't it? Were you? What were you talking about? Um, were you talking yeah, about yeah. snowdrops? I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, black hyacinths, yellow snowdrops. But when you when you watch the clip, my I. Like trying to intonate and pronounce everything so perfectly, it's like what? It's just so weird. Yeah, I can't watch it. <laughs> and I got no beard either. So anyway, back to you. Tell us more about yeah. your listening TV career. Sure, <laughs> listening. That's um, the wrong word, isn't it? <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So then we went. Then after that, we did Blue Peter. So we got asked because we were the cool, cool kids in um, yeah. in gardening for a little bit. Everyone's looking for the the people to make things cool in gardening, aren't they? Yeah. And, um, and skinny jeans were yeah. popular then as well. <laughs> yeah, they're still popular, right? Yeah, but they're not a thing like, like they were then, are they? Or are they? No. Uh, <laughs> no, they're just more of a staple now. It's just a state that everyone's got them yeah. in their back. They're now, like, funky. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Uh, also, can I just say, I actually read a thing, some kind of article the other day about skinny jeans that apparently because of lockdown, everyone's been in elasticated like waistbands and shorts um, and joggers the whole time. So no, yeah. like apparently, is this the end of the skinny jean? Because who wants to tuck it all oh. back in again? Well, you me, to I'd love to tuck it all in. But... Gardener. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, what? I'll let, I'll let you into a little gardener. secret. It's a little secret, and then we'll talk about gardening. Green brand? But, uh, no, but oh. what I don't actually, I haven't wore skinny jeans for about three years now. I wear jeggings. <laughs> oh. What's that? oh, that's really tight, isn't it? Well, they're elasticated waist, Michael. It's an absolute lifesaver. Oh. I don't know you there we go. Anyway, back to the gardening. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we um, started Blue Peter. So, um, that was really cool to be part of. Like, never did I think that I would be on Blue Peter. When I was younger, when I used to watch it, mm. I think um, I used to, I used to, I was like in the Chris Collins days when he was gardener there. Oh, so yeah. That's why I used to watch it. Um, and, yeah, never did I think that I'd then be on screen doing it do you know what I mean when we started the Blue Peter allotment up there I say we started it I mean it's TV behind the scenes they did a lot of it we come along and planted that up but we um, started the grow your own section on there which was which I'm really proud about and the allotment's still there now so um, oh, wow. yeah, it's really amazing what I, I like amazing to be part of I still wear the Blue Peter badge around the house but no one cares so um, so yeah <laughs> We all care. We know that you were a Blue Peter gardener, don't you worry? 
<laughs> but now, of course, you're skinny jean gardener, not plural anymore. And you've been doing loads of, you know, gardening shows all around the country. And we've seen you perform in, you know, yeah. in many of them. And they're brilliant for kids. So, like, for our listeners, just run us through a show. You know, what do you talk about? What do you do? How do you engage with with kids? What's it all about? Um, I call it the um, biggest, and it's the only, the biggest gardening entertainment show in the world. Uh, going back to the glittery jacket, in it, I wanted to bring um, kids entertainment and kids ed- um, education and blend it together in something really fun. So we've got loads of uh, kids gardening games and fa- it's a lot for the family. Uh, it's just to get involved and and uh, come on stage and be part of it. So we've got water pistols, we've got um, mm. seed sowing, all of that. And um, hopefully, you know what it's like, like, we're trying to get kids to learn about gardening, but without them actually knowing they're learning. That's really cool. They love it. And I've seen so much great feedback from parents, you know, that have been to these different shows, etc. Yeah, I think you did a really good... I think you ended up in a really good position, really, because kids gardening has really become your thing. You're probably the person that's most known for kids gardening as well, which is excellent. And, of course, you've released your book, which actually coincided with lockdown beginning, which the other day when we spoke, you saw that as a bad thing. But I actually see that as the perfect timing because the book came out just when parents needed to entertain their kids or kind of... You know, a lot of people were spending more time in their outdoor spaces as well. So I think it was, yeah, it worked pretty well. How do you yeah. feel about that? Do you feel like lockdown helped families to reconnect with their garden, et cetera? I definitely do, because we've got not got any distractions. I think that's the biggest thing. Like, we've got no, um, like, everyone uh, goes to play areas and zoos and things like that. And we couldn't do that throughout lockdown. So... Them distractions sort of yeah. forced us to use whatever space we've got, whether we've got a big garden, small garden, courtyard, whatever. It, it forced us to be out there and yeah. and do something. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I definitely think it, it, it has helped. It's definitely got a lot more people into gardening. And, like, really nice that I've seen, like, people pop up on Instagram and Twitter and say, oh, we've been using your book and, um, mm. and getting, getting involved with it. So... Yeah, it's been awesome. In that sense, to say lockdown's been awesome is a bit weird, isn't it? But it's been awesome in that sense. (laughs) I think everybody had a different narrative with lockdown, and that is what makes it really interesting. It's almost something that everybody went through, but everybody had a different outcome, really. But the best outcome, obviously, for us and our industry is that more people were engaging with plants than ever, which was just, I feel like it's been a golden moment for horticulture. It really has been. Hang on, sorry. What's up? Olive's arrived, star of the book. Yeah. Is she going to stick around for part two? We want her gardening tips. Is she whispering? Is she mouthing to you? <laughs> oh, we'll take, do you want to sit in here? Hello, Olive. Yes, hello. You need a toilet. Don't worry about the spider. You can't make a job. Oh, okay. I've got to go and get a spider. Just give me two seconds. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> Well, maybe when you come back, we'll be ready for part two with gardening tips, some of your kids' gardening tips, but perhaps we'll also get Olive on the mic. What do you reckon, Ella? I cannot wait to get Olive on the mic. She is the star of Skinny Jean Gardener, and she is also oh. star of the book. So, you know, well, they... Al- she comes back with a biscuit. They always say don't work with animals and children, so we'll give it a go. <laughs> cool. OK, well, why not join us in part two? We'll look at different ways to engage kids in your outdoor space or even some indoor gardening so stay tuned this episode of the plant-based podcast is brought to you by our friends at natural grower visit naturalgrower.co.uk to nurture your soil and boost your plants and veg so we're back with part two and in part one we were speaking to lee skinny jean gardener showman extraordinaire of the horticultural world without his gold sequin jacket, which is hanging up waiting for 2021. (laughs) So Lee's rise from electrician to showman uh, via Jimmy's Farm, Jamie Oliver, author, is now going to tell us 
It's the core of everything that he does, which is the best way to engage with kids and get them into gardening, because that's what it is all about, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. Grow your own has to be uh, the best way, like, without a doubt. Like, that's just what I've learned, especially with Olive, is showing uh, a kid, like, the tiniest of seeds that grows into, like, a tomato plant mm. or something that they love to eat... Um, it's like, like it's actually like being a magician. I always call it like being a magician. Yeah, I think it's absolutely so incredible. Cool. Yeah. Um, to, to grow your own is a hundred percent the to starting point. If you want to get kids outside and mm-hmm. um, and get gardening, get them growing something to eat. What kind of things do you recommend? Like, what is the if someone came to you who'd never gardened before? You know, they're in lockdown. They wanna. They've been enjoying getting outside in their garden, and they want to start growing something with the kids where do they start what would you tell them to do yeah this is a really um this is a hard answer because i'll tell you why i always get asked this because people want oh, what is the top five things for kids to grow mm-hmm. what is the quickest thing <clears throat> and there's loads of quick things to grow out there um which is great sure but if a kid like for radishes for example if a kid doesn't like radishes i don't know many kids that do like radishes i certainly didn't mm-hmm. when i was a child they're not going to care about it. You know, say, for example, my child really loves asparagus. Again, I'm not sure how many kids like asparagus. We all know that asparagus takes a long time to grow. But if they mm-hmm. really love it, then they're going to wake up every single morning, get out there yeah. and look after that. So it's all about really what the child loves to eat. Because it's pointless growing something. I, When I first started, grew loads and loads of onions. And I hate onions. And I just <laughs> didn't care about them. Turns yeah, out they grew anyway, but I didn't point. care about them. <laughs> Ellen does the same with courgettes. <laughs> I'm gonna, Doesn't everyone, though? To be fair, I'm going to leave you a whole pile of courgettes in your house when I leave because <laughs> I've God. so had enough of them. So oh. it's the same for adults, definitely. Why should children be any different? I always think that if I was a kid and someone said to me, now, what would you like to grow if it was the first thing ever? It would be a pumpkin, you know? Really? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely a but pumpkin. That's such a good point, Lee. I'd never thought of it that way around before. We're trying to force kids, oh, yeah, it'd be fun to grow this. But, yeah, just let them pick something, you know, walk around the supermarket, what fruit and vegetables they like. Let's show you how to grow this at home. I bet it's none really of them cool. pick sprouts. Yeah. We're, we're, sprouts also in a yeah. World, we're also in a world of, like, everything's so instant. So if we want to order something, mm. it can be with us the next day. Whereas gardening is never, as much as we want to try and make it cool and quick, it's never going to be like that. And yeah. one thing that we don't teach children is patience. That's mm. not taught anymore because yeah. we're in a world of instant. If we want to find something out, we'll just look on our phone. Like we get instant yeah. knowledge through that way. So I think gardening is really good for patience and teaching children that good things come to those who wait. Yeah, that's totally true. And kind of it worries me I'm going to sound really old now but it worries me when I see young people getting that instant gratification and I found then when they go into the workplace they expect everything much quicker they expect a pay rise or they expect a car or they expect I don't know you know a promotion because in all the years prior to that they've been able to get exactly what they want as soon as they want it and Gardening is all about focusing, it's about relaxing. I know it can be physically demanding as well, but that patience to understand that if you nurture something, if you work hard at something, if you look after something, then you will reap the rewards is something that is often missing um, when kids grow up nowadays. So you're at, that is completely and utterly right and I love that you know patience is so important for all of us and we and we even as adults having grown up maybe without social media and google even we in this like busy world we don't always practice patience do we so it's it's learning for for all of us you know we we all need it and that's just so important so there's low well I'm just giggling it's like you're doing a sermon now Ellen (laughs) Someone at the door. Oh, I thought someone's at the door. Oh. This is a nightmare. <laughs> Olive, oh, Olive's man. on lookout. Well, Lucky someone else is editing this. <laughs> can, can you come back up in a second? Hello? 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 
Yeah. yeah. Lee, we were just saying that this is obviously the reality of working yeah. from home and, and having the kids at home as well. I've never run up and down the garden so much. I'm so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. But it's not a problem. We're going to leave some no of that in. There was no really? Oh, right. Really? There was no one at the door. Oh, my gosh. Kids. Does uh, Olive need some attention? She is more than welcome. We'd love to have her on the podcast. She can tell us about so her I, gardening. I just said to her, I said, um, are you going to come up? And she goes, uh, I might do. So she might pop up again. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. If she pops up, oh, we're going to yeah. give her some questions, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. I, I, I think you know, on stage with me very often because she'll come to like, some of my shows and want to be on stage and then she'll just want to be like the centre of attention, which... She has to understand that is my job to be centre of attention. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's all oh, about God. Olive, really. So we were talking about, um, you know, how to start gardening with kids. And especially throughout lockdown, that, you know, we, we've realised so many people live in urban environments and they don't even have a garden. So mm. how do, what, what recommendations do you have for anyone that doesn't have an outdoor space? Um, what, no outdoor space at all? Well, shall we start yeah. with a patio, the then go to a balcony, and then go to a windowsill? Mm. Right, let's go through it. Right, so <laughs> what you say, courtyard first? Yeah. Um, it's a courtyard, container garden, Michael Perry's favourite. Uh, <laughs> um, but there's so many things now, like um, trugs and veggie pods and things like that, that you can grow in. But um, I really like to keep the cost low. So like in my book, I've got a really simple one, especially for children, to start off with. Because you don't want to go and spend out instantly. I think um, like the washing up bowl. I use the washing up bowl so much in my book. Okay, twice, not too much. Mm. Not a full, it's not a book full of washing up bowls. <laughs> and um, whack a few drainage holes in the bottom of it, fill it with soil, and then get the kids to grow, like say, a tomato plant, a pepper plant, maybe a little row of salad down the side. And that's like their own little mini allotment. Mm. If you pop it outside the back door... That's cute. I mean, I'd say courtyard. It could be any, any, anywhere, really. Um, mm-hmm. But um, if you want us to start off, it's a really easy one. We don't need to start digging into the ground. Um, and it's a good one for kids. If you've got a couple of kids, then get a washing up bowl each for them. And there's a little bit of a that's competition cool. as well. Do you know what I mean? That's cool. Well, I think the comp- make holes. You could have a pond. <laughs> well, that's well, that funny you say that, Michael. That's another make in the book. <laughs> a pond bucket is ace, and if you get frogs, that's so exciting. Like I still get excited oh, now. Like oh, kids would man. love that, wouldn't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I made, made a big mistake. Like we um, we had a little washing up bowl in the corner of the garden, and then I say I. No, I say olive, but I actually wanted a big trampoline in the garden, so we moved the frog pond. And we used to have frogs in there, and we used to go down there every morning and check them out. Now I've moved it, they've not come back, so um, I'm just praying that they come back at some point. I don't think there's enough um, foliage around it at the moment for them to be covered, but, but it's a good one anyway, yeah. Yeah, and there's <laughs> a lesson, don't move your frog pond. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, yeah, there you go. But they're probably walking around going, where's this frog pond? Where's it going, man? They're all under the trampoline still looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're just actually hopping around on the trampoline. How cool would that be? Um, yeah, that could be very fair. <laughs> what about if you have no outdoor space at all? Window sills. Like, mm-hmm. um, i tell you, I tell you one thing that I wanted to talk about today is... Um, but just before lockdown, I went on a school tour, and uh, I think that I, even me personally, had become into a bubble where I was like, everyone's got a garden, like everyone's got a space where they can grow. And I met so many kids that were a bit like, well, we can't do any garden because we've not got a garden or a balcony or anything. I've just got a windowsill. And I was like, you can still grow on your windowsill. That's still like a mini garden right there for you. And it really opened my eyes, like going on that tour and seeing how many children don't have that space so i think mm-hmm. like growing in like really simple things like the bottom of like milk cartons like really yeah. easy there's so many different things that we can turn into um the pots that we've just got hanging around the house and i think growing on windowsills even the smallest of plants um is a good one for kids to give them their own little mini garden in the windowsill mm-hmm. again it's something that they can wake up to in the morning 
and look after and care for mm. and be proud of. Be like their own little pet. Mm. Yeah, almost. Yeah, exactly. No, seriously, I think like that's a. Uh, it's again as as much as gardening is great for kids for patience. I think it's really good for responsibility as well. They're taking responsibility of something. That's exactly what a pet does, really. But mm-hmm. plants are. are um, a lot easier to go away on holiday and and come back to. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, um, in China there was this really cool shop called It's a Wonderful Life, which is a weird name for a shop, I know, but bear with. Which had lots of kind of like little wooden toys inside, but it had a really big section on wooden toy planters. So these were kind of like you know like stationary kind of pen pots, but had a um, kind of compartment to grow a plant in, or they were like miniature terrariums, kind of made of wood. And this was almost like a plant shop geared towards kids, which was really amazing. I've never seen anything like it in Europe at all. That's I'll, really I'll cool. I'll put some pictures up when we um when we do the social media for this podcast. But really incredible place, and you can imagine that really helps the kids to engage with plants from that really young age, and for plants to become a normal part of their day to day life. And you know. Plants in their bedrooms as well, you know, because that's an area as well. Cactus, succulent, they're so collectible. And this, you know, one of the places that I started gardening as well. I mean, so, carnivorous, yeah. oh, carnivorous say, plants. Sorry, growing cactus from seed is the best thing ever as well. It's really great for kids. That's it's cool. So I've heard a lot. I've heard, um, I think it was the, you will correct me on this, Michael, but is it the succulent, Cactus and Succulent Society? Is that yeah, them? yeah. Yeah, I get them. I get their. Ma- I get their magazine, and when I met met oh, someone yeah. from there, they were talking mm-hmm. about that. And to be honest with you, it's not something I've ever really properly looked into. But I get oh, it. Like, sure. it'd be really cool. Like, that's one of my missions. I think I might start doing that. Yeah. You know what I'm, I'm always cactus, learning. Cactus are really easy to germinate, and they come up and they don't look anything like a cactus. And it is really fun to watch them go through puberty and into maturity. It's really interesting. Yeah, great for kids. Oh, there you go. Good tip. Cactus grown. <laughs> and um, carnivorous plants are really cool for kids. You know, there's nothing yes. more fascinating than watching a Venus flytrap eat a fly at the end of the day. You know, for kids, that's just like crazy, isn't it? Do you know what? I really think the Venus tri- flytrap is a great one for kids. But I, um, I'd put money on after about two, three weeks, a Venus flytrap being dead. By the, yeah. Because even Being I would always put my finger in it to make it <laughs> to make it move, and by the end it'd be like yeah. I've had enough of it. But good fun in the meantime, and don't <laughs> forget, <laughs> don't forget. Um, I like Michael. You done a garden on a plate. That would be fun for kids as well like where you make a garden on a plate and you can oh, put like yes. a little oh, house on it or like yeah. a little fairy garden that kind of thing like fairy yeah. gardens have met and have like hugely taken off i've got to just put it out there they're not really my kind of thing but in america they're oh. everywhere <laughs> yeah i know sorry i don't want a fairy garden <laughs> i love fairy we've got loads of stuff for fairy gardens in but our you've garden. got kids I did actually just Someone called me from America the other week about fairy gardens. So it must be big over there. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's good. I think fairy gardens, I think, again, giving a child that area that is, is theirs, like owned by them, by putting like fairy gardens and plants around it, I think it's really important. Again, bringing that responsibility. It's great to get kids outside gardening mm-hmm. with you, sure, but all kids want their own space to look after. They don't want to go and tell their friends they've been helping dad. They want to tell, tell their friends they've got their own bit that they've been doing. Yeah. And also, yeah, maybe dad doesn't want the kids' help because dad might want his patch looking pristine. And it's not going to look pristine if kids are looking after it. So it's good to give the That's kids right. their own patch. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something, right, Alan, right? If you've got kids and you've got uh, an allotment or an area of the garden... You know that it doesn't matter how much you want that patch to look good, it ain't going to happen. So just get them <laughs> thoughts out of your head, all right? It's not going to happen. Plants are going to get trampled, and you just have to hold down that anger right deep <laughs> down. Just hold it down until uh, they turn 18. Okay. All I've got to say is that re- that reminds me of our last dog. We adopted a dog, and um, I'd, I'd got our... 
um, cottage garden, absolutely pristine. I mean, it was after probably about eight years of, you know, establishing it. And after about three days, it was absolutely, completely and utterly wrecked. Because the dog just used to whiz around and run through the borders and ripped up the lawn. And I was absolutely devastated. But after getting my head around it after a few weeks, you know what? Gardens are for everyone to enjoy. You know, that's kids, that's adults, that's animals, you know, wildlife. It, gardens are just, you know, they, they, can, they, they evolve, they're different. It depends what stage of life you're at, I guess. You have to just accept that, you know, they change depending on the circumstances. But I don't like fairy gardens because actually I believe that fairies really live in the garden. I believe they're real. You don't need a fairy garden because all gardens have fairies. <laughs> Can you tell us some of Olive's favourite projects from your book? And it would be great if she could tell us herself, perhaps. Is she, would, really, like, is she on mic now or is she running <laughs> off not somewhere? In. She's not even in oh, now. No. For all this whole podcast, she's been coming in and out. And the time we actually want her to come on, <laughs> she's probably watching Scooby Doo or something. Oh, my God. Program at the moment. <laughs> um, oh, oh. Oh, her favourite, um, do you want me to go and get her? If you would like to, if, yeah, if that's she's okay. To be a star, if she, she yeah. Okay. There's no promise. There's no promise she'll come on, alright? Just okay. wait there and on. No worries. Okay. Oh. Here comes the star. Here, here comes the star of the show. So introducing Olive to the plant based podcast. This is the first time we have had <laughs> An absolute gardening diva on the show. Hi, Olive. <laughs> Hello. 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 Have you oh, been watching Scooby you. Doo? It's Christmas, I think you <laughs> Have you been watching Scooby Doo? Yes. Was it yeah. good? What will you do next? Will you? What will you do next, Olive? Will you go out into the garden? Do you think? Yes. Cool. So can you tell us, Olive, what your favourite things are to do in the garden? What do you like doing? Jumping on the trampoline. Jumping on the trampoline. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> hey, Olive, I hear that you moved the frog pond so you could have the trampoline. Have you... We moved all the frog pond, don't we? Mm. And did you find... Have you found any frogs since you've moved the... Frog pond. What? No, when we moved the frog pond, you can speak. You don't have to whisper. Well, me to join. Yeah, you're on set, but you're actually on the microphone, so you can speak. <laughs> That's you don't want to speak. Oh. Thank you enough. I think that's the issue. She's very... Uh... <laughs> no worries, Olive. Well, it's OK. We don't mind. We just wanted to know how much you love the garden. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK. Yeah, no, you've got no chance today, mate, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> Never mind, Olive. Yeah. No worries at all. I'm glad that you enjoy Scooby-Doo. You want to say... We like it. She just. All right. Do you want to go back up? Mm. Right. Go on then. I'll be acting. Okay. She goes. I don't really like doing stuff like this. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh bless her! No. No. In a few years. Yeah. You know it. Prop. Nice. You know. In a few years, she'll say. It's one of your best props. Really like I don't really like doing stuff like this unless I'm getting paid. Uh, yeah. That'll be the next yeah. thing. That's exactly what's coming. She knows what she's doing. She completely knows. Bless her. Well, here's, the, like, here's the thing. Like, well, I've noticed such a change in her. Like, when, I'm, when I first, first started doing this, she didn't care about coming on. She absolutely loved it. And now she thinks, like, a lot more about coming on camera and being part of stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, yeah, I don't want to, you know, she's great. She she loves seeing me do my stuff, but she grows up and she don't want to be on. And I don't want her to be a prop, do you know what I mean? She's my daughter. I want, I'm, yeah, I want her yeah. in the bar. 
I want to remember the reason that I'm doing this, and that is to spend time with her in the garden. And mm. if that's not what she wants to do, that's cool with me. Do you know what I mean? Totally, that's absolutely right. So, what are the what's like what's been Olive's favourite pro- favourite projects from your book? Like, what are the things that she loves to do in the garden? Yeah, she really loved one of the ones that she really loved doing was the Carble Castle. So I split the book into grow your own, wildlife and fun. And the fun aspect was like creating a den. Because one of the things we got when she was about two was a, a playhouse. And I don't know, it was about 250 quid. And um, it hurt. It hurt to buy, <laughs> to buy it, to be honest with you. And uh, she didn't really use it that much. She started to use it a lot more now. But I just thought, like, for people that want to create a den or create a space for their kids to, to play in, mm-hmm. doing something like the Cardboard Castle is absolutely perfect. And Olive, actually, when we had the Cardboard Castle up, she loved it more than her little player. So I was like, why didn't I just do this in the first place? Uh, it costs a lot less, let me tell you. <laughs> so, yeah, the Cardboard Castle out of all of it was, was the best thing for her. She also loved doing the Wildflower Seed Balls, which who doesn't love doing a Wildflower Seed Ball? Um, and uh, and grow your own like she loves having a little area to grow her own stuff so it's especially like strawberries she's the biggest thing is strawberries when she started to be able to walk about and get around the garden I felt like I was growing a lot less strawberries mainly because she was eating them all <laughs> <laughs> I love the thing with the cardboard though because like we always say, like people always joke, you can buy kids the most expensive toys, but they take them out of the box and then play with the box, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> and you know you get like the smallest of things, don't you? The smallest of um, things delivered, and it comes in the biggest of boxes. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, like where we live over, over lockdown... They stopped collecting and recycling and everyone was moaning about it. And I was like, this is the best thing to happen because we've got so much craft stuff, so many boxes to co- turn into a cardboard castle. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I love that. That was my favourite one. And she painted it up and, and, and loved it. We played it. Obviously, when it rains, it's not so good. But the best thing is that you can um, mm-hmm. rip it all down and start again and create something new. So Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. That's really brilliant. And um, mm. Lee, so for any of the listeners who um, haven't, seen you on social media doing your thing where can they find you a few i do ask you i always say this if you just type in skinny jean gardener there ain't many of us um you'll find me on <laughs> google on twitter <laughs> um, anywhere I, I could like run a list of uh places but just type in skinny jean gardener and your book what's it called how to Get Kids Gardening. Okay. It's on Amazon. It was self-published. So I put it on Amazon and um, and you can get it on there. For, for the six weeks already, it's a tenner. I might, I'll tell you what, I might keep it like that for the whole year. Because I think it's, I want to try and make it as accessible as possible for people to get on. That's really cool. So check it out if you've got kids or are interested in kids gardening. Uh, Lee's book is brilliant. And I think both Michael and I have bought a copy for Friends or at least recommended it to friends who've uh, really enjoyed it. So thanks, Lee, for everything yes, you do. You I bring indeed, something very new to horticulture. You know, it's fun. And, I mean, it has a serious message to get kids into gardening, but, you know, how you uh, put it out there is fun and lighthearted. And I think that's super cool. So, you know, we've known you for a long time. You were on the podcast uh in the gossip as well last time as well so thank you so much for coming back on as an excellent guest um and maybe in the future we'll get olive on i know she's going to require a fee and she's going to want yeah. a studio and makeup artist and everything but maybe we'll Blue get her on sometime yeah <laughs> sure. no thank you two things before i go one one i've never done so much running or up and down the garden in a podcast interview before so i apologize for that and two, yeah. thanks to you two because when you two first started it's um podcasting you brought so much attention to the world of garden podcasts that um it really helped my listener figures so cheers <laughs> really oh wow thank you <laughs> well we expect big figures for this podcast then with all of us <laughs> together hey <laughs> thank you lee thanks for being a great guest and thanks for everything you do right, see you soon Hey guys, for this week's podcast, we're going to talk about memories, our gardening memories, because we're talking all about gardening for children. 
So we're going to take it right back to some of our very earliest memories. And some of mine are sowing seeds with my grandma, stamping out earwigs on the ground as well. I know that sounds a bit gross, but she taught me how to do it. Um, so yeah, let's just chat a little bit about our kind of gardening histories and our first memories of being kids in the garden. I mean, I had two sets of grandparents. <laughs> one was a little nana and a big granddad, and the other one was a big nana and a little granddad. Is that right? <laughs> I don't know, but basically they were kind of opposites, which was um, obviously to do with their size. One grandma was very small, the other one was very tall, and the same for the, the granddads. And we often thought, oh, we should kind of match those up together, the tall one with the tall one, and the short one with the short one. But anyway... That is delightfully off subject, but I think you like that sort of thing. So anyway, I was gardening a lot with my little, no, my little granddad and my big nana. So yeah, so that was really fun. Some of my earliest memories are, you know, sowing seeds, kind of that joy of the seeds just appearing. And almost like, I remember the year being punctuated by these different kind of gardening practices that I used to do with my grandma. So I remember the moments where she turned the cyclamen plants on the side just to give them their autumn rest and and also the fact that in I think it was June you'd usually take your geranium cuttings and then we'd always put them in these pots behind the shed in a little shady corner kind of such great memories of kind of the the kind of yearly calendar of gardening amazing I never had a patch of ground in my grandma's garden I just tended to kind of help her generally but I did have a patch of ground in my own garden and this obviously became bigger and bigger over the years as I kind of developed it and stole more and more land from my dad. <laughs> he was often growing vegetables, always the same sort of vegetables though, like carrots, radishes. Um, and they weren't, I have to say, they weren't the biggest carrots. I kind of have quite pitiful memories of the vegetable harvest that my dad used to produce when we were young but yeah um so yeah let me think about my first patch of ground i think at some point i tried to install a pond i don't know why i was obsessed with water gardens for a while and um oxygenating plants having tadpoles in there of course um yeah but i don't think i had a good liner and i think it leaked so that was when i then hounded my dad to make me a half barrel which i could then make into a little miniature pond it needed to be sealed though, I remember it was quite a process to get those, get that wood sealed up, but of course dads are perfect for that sort of job, so it was all sorted for me, all ready to put my water plants in and my water life, so that was really fun. What else do I remember about the patch? Hmm, my earliest memory, which I've probably quoted on the podcast before, is growing an amazing Tradescantia houseplant from a cutting at school on the windowsill in the classroom and then taking it home to plant it and for some reason yeah for some reason I was going to plant it outside which already sounds very crazy but as I dug the hole I turned around and I stood on this plant and it's probably one of my earliest memories of not just growing but also crying (laughs) because it was just such a tragic moment oh and my first plant was dead I stood all over it. I probably wasn't um, adept enough to know that you could easily take a cutting of a Tradescantia and they're pretty much impossible to kill. So I kind of wasn't that quick off the mark with that. But anyway, uh, my garden developed. I remember this patch just kind of almost grew by six inches every season. Um, what do I remember growing? So a lot of plants that I'd split with my grandma. We also had a peach tree. I can't remember where that came from. But this was growing, it was great because it kind of grew every year, it was becoming a really nice tree in the garden. But it had this peach leaf curl, which obviously is a disease that you guys might know about. And one of the only ways to get rid of that is to pick off all the affected leaves. So I remember that was quite a, quite a puzzling job to do midsummer every year. We never got peaches from this tree though, I have to say. Next to the peach tree was a Christmas tree an old Christmas tree, obviously from lounge to garden, easy as done. Uh, And then the borders, I remember there was some borders around the grass that were quite narrow and, you know, if I was going to do that now I'd have slightly taller plants, more impact, because it's always a bit weird to see some kind of dull 
marigolds just next to the fence. And But then in those days, of course, there weren't as many different varieties of flowers available. So we were quite limited to the things that we just saw in the garden centres because, of course, plants weren't being sold by mail order at that stage. You know, plants have only been sold by mail order since kind of the early 90s and it was Thompson Morgan that pioneered that so the kind of landscape of how you bought plants has changed and with that the demand for new varieties has obviously got stronger and stronger yes what else did I grow I used to make some hanging baskets as well traditional ones with moss in the side um, lots of different planters too but also I started selling plants when I was Mm, excuse the um, the noise of this um, German town this morning. There's motorbikes coming through and cars and everything. So I thought I found a quiet space, but it seems I haven't. Um, yeah, so I started selling plants at the Women's Institute Market. I was member number 13, I believe. And we had to put little labels on our staff. And we obviously got, um, we got paid for the items. And we paid a little bit of commission each time. Yeah, it was really fun. I think I was the only male member. Certainly the youngest member in the WI market. But I used to do some, yeah, some great growing for that. And it was almost the way I earned my money. I wasn't really taking any pocket money off my parents at all. Everything that I spent, I'd earned myself, which I feel quite proud of now, to be honest. And that's still the case to this day. You know, I could probably you know, count up a very small amount that has ever been given to me by my parents. I've always been a very independent woman. <laughs> so yeah, so I was selling plants at WI. I then started selling by mail order. I had a little advert that I put into Gardener's World magazine and used to sell the, the baby herb plants. I had a, a little nursery area all laid out. All the herbs were alphabetical. I kind of had a stock count every now and then. It was like a mini business. It was pretty cool. For the purpose, I bought a photocopier. <laughs> don't know why. Because I had to photocopy my catalogue. Because people could request this catalogue out of the back of Gardener's World magazine. Obviously, then receive this listing and then place an order. But remember, in those days, this was all a lot slower. You know, people were sending checks in the post. I was then mailing it out. There wasn't email or anything like that to speed stuff up. It, it feels crazy when you think of it now. But yeah, I think in the total time of Springfield Herb Nursery I had oh I don't know about 10 orders it wasn't really big style <laughs> but it really did um, kind of teach me about kind of handling my own money which is great because it's all very well to have kids gardening projects but if you can weave that in with some sort of enterprise that teaches them about you know earning their own money and having a few entrep entrepreneurial ideas then that's a pretty good thing actually so yeah what would I have done differently as a kid? Would I have been engaged with plants if it wasn't for my grandma? Hmm, very good questions, actually. I think sometimes you often end up loving the thing, or not loving, but you get most exposure to the activities and hobbies that your grandparents do, because they tend to babysit you, you know, often, and you spend more time with them as you do your parents sometimes. So, yeah, it was natural that I would pick up gardening from them which was fab and obviously I'm very thankful to that you know many many years later so yeah so that's my little background a few gardening memories of when I was knee high to a to a grasshopper I hope you've enjoyed it we're going to hear Ellen's next oh gardening memories it was so nice to hear Michael's there I love that he was part of the WI <laughs> So when I knew we were going to be talking about kids' gardens and memories, I was thinking of kind of the key moments in my childhood where I just really enjoyed plants or when something was kind of triggered and made me realise how important plants were. And I can go all the way back to being tiny. And I would say that probably the first seven or eight years um, in my life, so in my early childhood days, they were pretty turbulent, if I'm honest. And I used to seek solace in the garden. And even at that age, 
I knew that being outside made me feel better. And so I would go into our garden. We had a lovely uh, patio area and then uh, a lawn and there was a big tree with a, a rope swing hanging off the tree. And at the end, we had a vegetable garden and I used to go and sit down there in the shade I used to pinch the peas from the pods because that's when they taste the best (laughs) and I was probably the only child that loved gooseberries and uh, I truly believed and I'm sure that I've said this before that fairies lived under our garden shed the shed was blue and I was always told never to go in that shed And I genuinely believed it's because fairies lived there. And I think it was a form of escapism. And much later in life, of course, I found out that it was because my dad was brewing beer. There were no fairies. But, you know, secretly, I think fairies were still there. But even from that age when things were quite tough, I knew that being outside and being around the plants made me feel better. And then as I got a little bit older... We had a gorgeous doggy called Prince and he used to plod around the garden with me and I used to take him for walks and um, we would go down the beach. So just being outside all the time is so important. Um, And I think when I very first started to garden, I was probably a little bit older. I'd say we're looking now between about 8 and 10, 11. And my uncle... He had one of those really long council house gardens where you step down onto a pavement, a, a, a pathway that used to run all the way down to the end of the garden. You couldn't see the end of the garden, long and thin. And to the right was a small lawn with a border and it was full of marigolds every single year, bright orange marigolds. And I can remember standing on the doorstep, always wondering why there were always marigolds. And I can't remember if I asked. I don't know if I did or didn't. But I can remember the thought, why are there always only these orange flowers? And um, the second half of his garden was an organic vegetable garden. No chemicals allowed. And he used to send me down there to pick the caterpillars off the cabbages. I used to collect them into a jar... I have no idea what happened to them when they went in that jar. I wouldn't like to think now. But I used to pick them off the cabbages and I would spend hours out there just absolutely loving it. And I can always remember thinking, how does this tiny seed sown in this kind of ramshackled greenhouse grow into something so magnificent that you can eventually eat? So that kind of magic and kind of miracle of gardening has always always been there for me right from the very very beginning um as we got older we moved out of our house with a big garden we uh, lived in a tiny house and it had what I can only describe as a yard and my mum would always make sure there were really bright colorful hanging baskets which was so pretty and when it rained I used to go and sit in the shed am I the only person that's ever done that I'm pretty sure people used to think I was completely crazy but when it rained I'd sit in the shed because the sound of the rain hitting the shed was just fabulous I just used to love it I used to find it so therapeutic and then I can actually remember the kids that lived um, the other side of our garden, their garden backed onto ours, used to call me the girl who lived at the end of the garden. <laughs> Never knew my name. I think they do now. But they didn't know my name, but I was always in the garden. I was always down the end of the garden. <laughs> and then I guess we moved again and we had a lovely garden and, you know, I'd be paid 50 pence to mow the lawn. Little did they know I would have done it anyway for nothing. <laughs> But yeah, I used to mow the lawn and get involved with pruning and planting and stuff. And so green fingers have really always been in our family. My dad was the vegetable gardener. My uncle was a gardener through and through. And my stepdad, he is an amazing gardener. He has an allotment to absolute die for. And he's now like in his 80s and it's still pristine. Of course, my mum's always prettied things up and we've always had houseplants. So my granddad, he worked the land. I mean, it's in all of us, really. So that's been really special to kind of have that connection the whole time. 
But there's one thing I have to say, which may or may not sound odd, I don't know. But when I was in my early teens, um, when we were living in the house with just the yard, uh, I used to walk our dog. And we had a couple of cemeteries and great graveyards kind of around where we lived. And I used to walk the dog through there. And do you know what? Absolutely used to love it. It's where I learned about wildflowers because whilst they seem like a place of sadness, lots of them have areas where, you know, grass is left to grow. Nature does its own thing. Generally, lots of trees or well, these ones were anyway. And I used to spot the wildflowers and then I used to go to the library. This is Gulston Library, Gulston on Sea in Norfolk. <laughs> I used to go to the library and ID the wildflowers. I know, what a geek. <laughs> Not many people would actually know that, my parents. But um, yeah, I used to go and have a look at what those wildflowers were. And then I would, next time I was walking the dog, I would then go and make sure I could remember what they were. So <laughs> I've always been a plant geek and plants have always, always made me feel calm and tranquil and happy. And gardens and plants have got me through tough times. They have made the world a better place. And now I just absolutely am absorbed in the world of plants and also I should just mention if you didn't already know of course those hundreds of marigolds that were planted in my uncle's garden every year they were for companion planting so they were there to deter aphids and pests and stuff away from his prized vegetables so Gardening for me throughout all of my life has been so important. You know, in my early 20s, definitely not quite so much. I, mean, I lived in London and uh, was working and partying a little harder <laughs> than I might like to admit. I definitely wouldn't be able to do that now. But when I was younger, gardening and nature were so important. And so I think this podcast where we've chatted with Lee skinny jean gardener all about getting kids into gardening I cannot tell you how important it was for me and almost all of our guests on the podcast say how they've either been into plants and gardening since they were young or they've come back to it later in life and they've kind of remembered something that happened in the garden or with plants when they were young so it's always there it's all it's really important to kind of have this nature gardening plant aspect in children's lives so what I think is and I'm absolutely sure it's the case for everybody all around the world is that plants really do make people happy This episode of the Plant Based Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Natural Grower. Launched in 2019, their award winning liquid fertilizer and soil conditioner is made entirely from maize. Naturally rich in nitrogen, potash, phosphate, and other trace elements that plants and vegetables love, it is approved by the Soil Association, Vegan Society, and Organic Farmers and Growers. Visit naturalgrower.co.uk to nurture your soil and boost your plants and veg. Enter PBP15 for a 15% discount as a PBP subscriber. Thanks for listening. You should now be at least 25% more obsessed by plants. Please follow us on social media. You'll find us by typing in The Plant-Based Podcast. We also have a fabulous website. Go to theplantbasedpodcast.net. So tell your friends, leave a review. Why not write a letter to your local MP? Please spread the word about the plant-based podcast. Oh, yes. See you next time, plant friends. The theme music for the plant-based podcast is an excerpt from the song Grow by Mikey James. And our editing is done by Gareth Patch of Semi Echo.